So I would like to start uh, by asking you, Professor, um, what has your, um, um, well, can you talk to us a bit about your study uh, regarding urban warfare? What have you been sure. looking at uh, more specifically? For sure. Well, the, the, the study is, a, is in an initial stage mm. and emerged out of a project on infantry tactics, uh, which I did from 2010 through to 2013. Um, so where is it? It's, it effectively follows the interest of Western forces in urban warfare. If you look at the um, history of the last 20 years, um, mm. there has been an increasing interest in urban fort warfare by the we major Western powers. Initially, in response to events like Grozny, 1994-95, some aspects of the Balkans, of course, the American disaster in Mogadishu in 1993. So Western forces started to become aware of the problem, the increasing problem of, and the increasing likeliness mm -hmm. of um, urban combat. Iraq and Afghanistan have made that, have accentuated that Concern, And if we look at the major Western powers, um, America, Britain, France, Germany, and Canada as well, uh, over the last 10 years, there's been very significant investment in terms of looking at the problem of urban, war of urban warfare. Um, and there are two, effectively, levels at which this has occurred. Um, the first is at the purely tactical level with the actual combat troops themselves engaged in both clearance operations, high intensity clearances, capture operations, and also stabilization operations of actually securing and pacifying uh, urban areas. Now at that level, um, one of the interesting developments has been the uh, dissemination of special forces techniques out from the special forces down into the conventional forces, and mm -hmm. I would argue that started to happen really follow, really following, and as a result of enduring the Iraq uh, war, uh, the techniques of urban clearance that have been completely um, the preserve and monopoly of the special forces, mm -hmm. then started to be adapted and learned and adopted by conventional forces. Why is this interesting? Because what you see is the urban environment becoming a driver of professionalization within mm. the Western Armed Forces. And that as a result of the urban imperative, mm. there has been an improved and increase in training to create kind of quasi special forces capabilities within uh, the conventional forces. Now, that's purely at the tactical level. The next question, which is the most important of the urban operations, is, is the actual missions themselves. And this, this is, has generated and continues to generate great difficulties and concerns across Western forces. Namely, how do you conduct major military operations in an urban area? How do you supply them? How do you do communications? How do you command them? And currently, all the Western powers are experimenting with how best to do that. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned that um, uh, regular forces are becoming more like special forces yeah. in, in uh, several countries. Yeah. Um, it, do you think that's the entire di diagnosis, or would you say that uh, regular forces are also becoming more like police forces? Um, well, that, that, it's, a, it's a very interesting point. In, in terms of the armies, um, <laughs> It would depend on the mission. Um, uh, what, I spoke originally about um, uh, clearance missions, missions where you're capturing or, or killing ca terrorists. Mm -hmm. um, that's one side of, the oper of urban operations. The other side are the um, operations of pacification, securing. And at that point, as you rightly say, um, there is a police gendarmerie military police element to the mm -hmm. operations. Um, but what I would say there is that, in fact, um, in the West, I mean, I'd be interested to know in terms of Brazil, and we've spoken about it, um, uh, in terms of the West, when a military force is securing a city, um, although there are potential police elements, the way that Western forces are thinking about it is still in, mil in primarily military terms of securing physical infrastructure mm -hmm. and securing 
population areas in a way that is predominantly still militaristic. Right. And in your research, are you looking into just the effectiveness of urban warfare? Are you looking also at the ethical questions, for example, or other um, dimensions to it? Well, the and, project... And, and also the, the roles of uh, armed forces, for example, as we mentioned, um, yeah. should armed forces um, operate as police forces? And, and should a regular force be specialized as yeah. special forces? Yeah. For uh, well, let, let me say this. Um, the project you know, is my next project. So the work mm. that I've done so far is only, initi uh, only initial, and indeed most of the work I've done relating to the previous project on infantry tactics has been purely at that tactical level of infantry troops clearing buildings and clearing rooms. So mm -hmm. what I'm about to say is a speculation of the work that I'm going to do. Um, my primary aim will not be policy, though. It will not be, in a certain sense, what the best way to use the military will be. What I'll be trying to look at is um, a historical sociological analysis of the techniques, tactics, mm -hmm. processes that the military are actually adopting in the West in a historical in a historical context. So, yes, there will be policy elements, and I, you know, I will obviously and hope to produce some idea, some contribution to the best way, the most appropriate way to use military forces. But my, my actual focus will be merely on looking at the way the armed forces in the West are responding to the urban challenge. What are the organisational transformations, the mm. doctrinal transformations, which the, arm, the armies and the armed forces have decided have have been critical in order to in order to operate in the urban domain. I mean, one of the key areas that I think will be critical will be the fusion and cooperation with other services, mm -hmm. and the low level fusion of different kinds of technologies. So, I think what you will find in an urban operation, what the military are finding, is that um, you need to layer surveillance in a way that's quite unique, so that. You know, if you look at the Ukraine, the Russian forces in Ukraine, they had about 14 layers of uh, intelligence and surveillance, you know, airplanes down to very small UAVs flying between the buildings. Mm -hmm. And I think the Western militaries will need to do that. The use of tanks and armoured vehicles, they're totally critical in any urban operation, but they are used in a quite different way than the conventional way of using armour in large formations. And so... It's those institutional, organisational, cultural transformations that I'm interested in. As I say, there will be a policy... Obviously, I will have some policy-relevant material, but my primary thing is seeing the actual... How does an organisation mm -hmm. respond to an organisational problem of, very, you know, of a very significant nature? That will be the focus of the, of the research. Um, mm -hmm. I see. And... Uh how do you think that Brazil could possibly contribute to this uh, analysis? Well, I, mean, I, I personally, and this is one of the reasons I'm delighted to be here, I think Brazil, because of the, the nature of the major Brazilian cities, with their, you know, in some cases quite large favelas, and the emergence of these very significant gangs like the Commando Vermelha, I think Brazil is in an absolute, you know, a prime position of experience... Um, I mean, it has a unique experience, but it has a very early experience of some of the problems of mm. policing, pacification, and also clearance of some of these areas. And so for me, actually, um, I think Brazil represents a, a, a very interesting advanced case, mm. which I think Western power should take very seriously. And if we look at... European cities and Americans, I mean, American cities already see various areas where you have very similar gangs operating to PCC, PCC or the Commando right. Romelia. But I think in European cities, I think something very similar is emerging. Much larger cities, much larger poor slum areas, and gangs and insurgent groups operating in those, in those areas. I mean, in France, I think the terrorist attacks over the last 18 months, two years... I think potentially point to something quite interesting. I mean, mm. when I say interesting, something potentially fr very frightening, but a challenge mm. 
that I think the traditional gendarmerie police may have difficulty coping with. And that, that's where I see Brazil being potentially a very important and interesting partner in a, gr in a global discussion. I see. And um, do you intend to analyze some other countries which have had, let's say, a particular experience in urban warfare, aside from Brazil, and also some of the ones you mentioned? I'm thinking specifically of uh, Israel, for example, which has had... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Terrible and yeah, yeah, yeah. experience uh, in that. In that I area. mean, l let me emphasize, the, I envisage starting this project properly for next year when I finish my work on generalship and, and command. Right. Um, but yeah, I see it, I see it in, as a global project. So mm -hmm. the major military powers, major, pa major pa you know, countries and civilizations which have demonstrate you know have an experience of urban problems and uh, uh, warfare and, uh, and I see it in historical terms too so my idea would actually be to go back to the beginning of civilization and look at urban warfare in a purely historical sense because one of the things I might suggest is that although um, I think there are paradigms of urban warfare what are the paradigms I think that the the nature of the urban warfare is given by three interrelated factors the size of the city the size of the civilian population and the size of the armed forces. I think there is an interrelationship between those three mm -hmm. agents which give rise to the kinds of paradigm of urban combat you get. And I think that therefore there are historic paradigms of urban warfare going back to the beginnings of civilization. So, you know, early civilization cities are relatively large, armed forces are small, so you get a particular kind of, uh, of paradigm of warfare. I think that in the 21st century, we have actually quite small armed forces and absolutely vast cities. And so the, the problem of urban operations in the 21st century is very distinctive historically. However, I do think that there are recurrent themes. Mm. What are the one of the current recurrent themes? I think certain elements of urban warfare involve issues of the channeling and defence of Point. So that the actual architecture of urban defence actually recurrent is, is recurrent. And therefore, what I'd like to do is a, is a global study of urban warfare, which goes back to the earliest periods, to try and trace out these potentially recurrent themes of the use of fortification, the use of citizens as a way of structuring and controlling the urban population. Um, but it definitely, I see it in, in, yes, it is likely as a Western scholar that the, some of the primary contemporary material is Western, but yes, mm. I think the Israeli example would be very important. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's some important Asian examples as well, both historically mm. and in the contemporary environment. I think Russia is very important. So, yeah, I see it in those, in those terms. And therefore, this for me makes Brazil a very interesting... I think possibly the most interesting Latin America example. It's not the only Latin America mm -hmm. example. I mean, yes, you can think of the violence in Mexico City or Guatemala City, and, and yes, or Colombia, precisely. Mm -hmm. But so, I, 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 and that's how I would conceive conceive the project um, in those kind of global ter global terms, in the ideal situation, anyway. Okay. Um, is there anything else you think we should know about your study before we move on to the next topic? No, uh, I mean, like the, the, ur the urban, and to emphasise and to caveat what I've just said, the urban project is, hopefully it's more than an aspiration, but I have not yet committed my, you know, I've not done the research. I, I, like, these are ideas about where the research will go and explaining why I think mm. urban warfare is a critical topic for... Mm -hmm. people interested in warfare but actually for sociologists political scientists international relations scholars I think it's a critical 21st century I think it's critical I think the city is a critical issue nice. um, okay well so moving on to the next topic yeah sure um, regarding uh, gender issues in yeah. the military yeah you have written um, about this topic yeah. could you tell us a little bit about what you have found sure. in your research sure. um, the best way to do this is just to give a little bit of background in terms of where the work on women in the combat, um, in ground combat roles came from. Um, the project, the wider project was a uh, analysis of 
um, infantry tactics and cohesion from the First World War to the present. And the central thesis of that project was that if you look at Western forces and their infantry forces in particular and their platoons, the smallest unit, um, that actually um, over the course of the century, and especially in the last 20, 30 years, those forces have professionalised. And professionalisation has transformed the nature of the combat performance of the infantry platoon and the cohesion, the solidarity within it. And my central argument is this. Essentially, uh, if you look at large conscript forces, I mean, except for Britain, all Western powers had conscription uh, through most of the 20th century. Um, essentially, um, those conscript forces were not particularly effective. Why? They were not particularly well trained, especially for the major wars of the 20th century. How did con conscript armies motivate their troops? Um, they essentially appealed to their patriotism and to their masculinity. So that they created these teams bonded by their masculinity and their commitment to the nation and on that basis they would fight in, in the major wars. Mm -hmm. So masculinity was a critical motivating element in the 20th century mass conscript army. Mm -hmm. My argument is that you move post 1970s into an era of professionalised forces, instead of appeals to manhood, professional training becomes the key way of generating combat force. It then becomes no longer significant that people are white, that they are heterosexual, it doesn't, it's not so important. The key thing is their job, whether they can perform their job. Now, merit. Correct. It's a merit, it becomes a meritocracy. And this then, out of this question emerged, or out of this study, emerged the question of, right, if, if, it's, if performance, merit, mm -hmm. capability is the critical way of motivating troops and of assessing whether they are, have a right to serve in the infantry, can women also not be in the infantry? If it's, if it's just a job, mm -hmm. an extreme job, but if it's a job in which capability defines who can be in those units, mm. does gender become an ir irrelevant factor? This was combined with the fact that if we look at Iraq and Afghanistan, um, all of the Western forces that were involved in the major fighting, so America, Britain, mm. and Canada in particular, what they found is they couldn't run the operations without incorporating women into frontline combat units, even if as in the case of America and Britain, mm -hmm. it was illegal to do so. So formally, women were not allowed in combat units in Iraq and Afghanistan, but the demands of the operation ensured and in fact demanded that women served in frontline combat outposts and in frontline forward operation bases and went out on patrol with infantry troops. So the reality mm -hmm. became that women were incorporated and were part of combat troops and combat forces and in many cases those women fired upon and were fired upon insurgent groups in Afghanistan mm -hmm. and in Iraq and doing as I started to talk to both male and female soldiers what emerged was precisely the point mm -hmm. that what became critical for their incorporation acceptance was not whether they were a woman or a man could they do the job Right. Were they professionally competent to serve mm. on the front line? Mm. And what overwhelming numbers of the women and the men said, if a woman was capable, mm. they were accepted. So what we see is an extreme professionalisation mm. in which the process of professionalisation has created space in which a group of people once totally deemed incapable of serving actually could serve in the infantry units. So and my point would be um, that in, in a professional force, a highly professional, highly trained force, the opportunity is there for integrating women into frontline combat units. Would you say that it is inevitable that women will be, whether legally or not, uh, involved in frontline combat if they are already operating or conducting duties, military duties in other areas and uh, an armed force actually goes to war, a, a real war, a real conflict. Do you think that is in, an inevitability that we 
that we would just have to prepare for, or would you say something else? Well, one could one could envisage a military that extracted women from units as they deployed into combat zones. Mm. But what Iraq and Afghanistan would show... But that, would they not be treated as civilians in that case? Potentially. But I mean, uh, so, so, so in an extreme case, I could think of an example where the inevitability would not happen. But if we look at Iraq and Afghanistan, exactly as you say, that once women are incorporated into the force, into the force anyway, and remember in terms of both the British and the American forces, women were in the combat service and mm. combat support units, that line between what was in the arm, army units that were logistics or signals or artillery, it, it became impossible to maintain it. So one would say, in effect, it became inevitable that women mm -hmm. were integrated into the combat units. And certainly I think in Western countries where the gender settlement has become so important and the nature of professional equality has become so important that I think it was inevitable that mm -hmm. women were incorporated into, into combat units. Whether that is true for Brazil, I couldn't absolutely say, but I think there is... There is, a, there is an organisational pressure mm -hmm. for that to, to occur, without question. Right. So, um, considering the countries that you mentioned, the mm -hmm. first world countries that you're analysing, um, which one has actually made more progress in terms of um, integrating women and sure. actually getting good results from that sure. in, terms of in, in operations? Yeah, sure. Well, we, we discussed this earlier. I mean, my own, my own interpretation here is that you would argue that Canadian Armed Forces and the Canadian Army is the most advanced. Why? There, there are about three reasons for this. Firstly, the Canadian Armed Forces integrated first. So they integrated women in 1989 and therefore were 10, 15 years in front of America and Britain in terms of, in, in terms of the integration. They're also a highly liberal, multicultural society which prides itself on its laws of equality. So, so there was civilians' culture that, that assisted, assisted the uh, integration. Finally, the armed forces are extremely small, so um, the integration of known women, the armed forces are so small that many of the women, almost all the women who were integrated from the combat arms were, had a reputation were known, mm -hmm. they, they were integrated... In, essentially, in, in essence, as individuals, as known soldiers, known to many other male soldiers. So the Canadian Armed Forces are the most advanced, um, but they have certain organisational advantages. Mm. Interestingly, which is the armed force that has the most female combat veterans? America, by, by a very great distance because of the size of the armed force and the intense commitment both to Iraq and Afghanistan. So although Canada has, I think, the actual culture of the armed forces is most modern and professionalised, the American armed force has the most female combat veterans. And I would be confident that the current integration of women in the, fee in the American armed forces will, will prove to be successful. Now, if, if I'm, you might permit me, I might say some issues about, about, about the integration. Um, I think the integration has been successful in a place like Canada. I think it will be successful in, a, in an armed force like America, the American Army. It is not easy. Um, and there are, certain, there are certain conditions that any force considering the, the mm. issue of female integration uh, needs to contemplate, I think, very seriously. Firstly... Given the physical requirements of combat infantry duties or ground combat roles in the infantry or in the armoured regiments, and if you look at Canada and America, you're looking at figures of perhaps 1% of your combat units, probably less than 1%. So you're talking very small numbers of women will be integrated. Very small numbers of women will be, will be integrated. That has very serious policy implications. My point here would be... Given small numbers, one should investigate the opportunities of recruiting women who are already in the armed forces, mm -hmm. who ever already hold a rank of an officer or an NCO, a corporal or a lieutenant, mm -hmm. 
to be drafted into the infantry already experienced in order to create social distances. And personally, because the numbers are so small, I would advocate a specialist role, radio operator, medic, sniper, because they're, they're so small. Second point, you need to be aware of the continuing gender discrim discriminations, um, which exist and are a reality. Right. In spite of professionalisation, if you look at Western Armed Forces, there is resistance to gender integration into the combat units. Now, some of this is has a basis in reality. There are concerns and genuine concerns about fraternisation, namely sexual relations between young female soldiers and young male soldiers, and they are or they represent an organisational problem. Related to this is a more rational thing of pure masculine bias. And I've got evidence of that where males have been discriminatory, mm. abusive and harassing towards women for no reason whatsoever. So you have a highly professional, capable women soldier who is subjected to bullying by mm. male colleagues. And, and any force contemplating integration needs to be a bit aware of that. Right, well... Our time is a bit limited, so okay. um, if you don't mind, I'd like to go on to our third and last yeah. topic. You know, the conversation is very interesting, uh, which is command. Yeah. So can you tell us a sure. little bit about so this? Sure. So the latest project is on command, on divisional command. And the yes. essential, my essential argument is that if you look at Western forces, in the light of new combat operations, especially in the urban environment, mm. the nature of command has changed. Instead of one commander who directs essentially all of the operations, and it is himself, what you see in headquarters mm -hmm. in Western countries is the emergence of what we might call command teams, command boards, command networks. Mm -hmm. Military operations are so complicated, the decision cycle has multiplied, and therefore the designated supreme commander mm -hmm. needs a series of deputies, agents, and proxies who are given jobs underneath his supreme role mm. and they have subordinate decision-making capabilities. So that in an army division, for instance, which is the formation I've been studying, mm. um, a general sets the mission, his subordinates are empowered mm. to deliver decision-making while the commander is committed to other factors. And this is very important in the urban environment because the urban environment is so multiple mm -hmm where the senior commander has a political role as well as a military one, he needs to have the support of subordinate commanders who are making purely military decisions simultaneously mm. with his own cycle of decision making. So what you see across Western powers, led by the US, is the emergence of these more complex command teams, command boards, command networks, mm. which now coordinate and run military operations collectively. And what you're referring to, if I understand correctly, is delegation of power within the chain of command, which would be different from uh, staff duties. Having a general staff, for example, yeah. is that... Yes, so the, the staffs have increased in size, but what is very noticeable from the 20th century, instead of having a general with one principal staff officer and a staff, mm. you have, a, have a, a cohort of normally one-star generals, very senior generals, below the, my work is on the division, so below the divisional command of the two-star major general. And it's here in the, this suite of assistant commanders, deputy commanders, deputy commanding generals, that we see a very significant transformation. And they are not just staff officers. They have actual executive authority, delegated executive authority. Absolutely, they're deferential to the commander. The commander becomes a key reference point, mm. but that they provide this delegation of decision-making executive power between the commander and the staff. And typically, they themselves are mm. sitting on top of a pyramid mm. of delegated staff officers who help and assist them themselves. Right, right. How new is this, do you think, or how um, strong is this tendency, considering, for example, that uh, the German army during the Second World War had a tendency of delegating a lot, even to the level of lieutenants, for example? Well, we, we perhaps don't, don't want to go into the full details. I mean, some of the 
my, some of the um, these arguments about the existence of this delegation, and I've in the in the book that I'm working on, I've written, about, I think it's exaggerated. I think there mm. was a level sometimes of delegation in the Wehrmacht, but the delegation was to particular levels. So, for instance, to the divisional level, the divisional level had, you know, the divisional commander had great powers. But actually, um, what I would argue in the 20th century was, although there is a a tradition of supposed mission command mm -hmm. um, that actually, typically in the 20th century, including in the Wehrmacht in the, 20, in the Second World War, that actually command was very directed and that the supposed freedom that subordinate commanders had was much more limited than we might, uh, that we might think. And indeed, the institution of mission command Refer which which go which is which uses the Wehrmacht as an example is actually a much more contemporary environment, but but precisely as you say the issue the emergence of mission command as a command philosophy is in my view part of this process of command collectivization that it and it and it is essentially a a novel a new development in the way that military the military military's command a response to the complexity and multiplicity of military operations in the 21st century. Right, and just one last question so that we can uh, stop. Um, do you think that uh, this tendency of delegation will actually last in practice, uh, considering the advances in technology, particularly um, how even the lowest ranking soldiers have cameras in their helmets, which the generals can see and yeah. give instructions from? Yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. In, my in, in headquarters, uh, from no, safety. I mean, my argument is it would be this, complete. Digital co communications have um, very significantly changed the nature of military operations and the nature of military command. But there is an interesting irony here. Digital communications have allowed militaries to conduct military operations over very wide spaces of time and distance. Theoretically, allowing a senior commander to see into the lowest level of forces. But that's not actually what's happened. As a result of digitalization, there's been an expansion of military operations in terms of its space, an ability to coordinate military forces with other elements, with air assets, with helicopters, etc. And so the ironic result of digital communications is not stripping out levels of command, but actually requiring more command capacity. Let me give you one very quick example. Do, the Americans now have instituted a system called Mission Command for their divisions. So the main headquarters is based in the US. Mm. So a three quarters of the staff stays in the US. The, the division deploys to Europe, to Iraq, to Africa with its commander forward. And so you've got this expansion of the operations with a division of the headquarters between the theatre and the continent of America. That division has not undermined the requirement for command. It's actually increased the need for command presence, both forward and back in the rear and in subordinate areas. So my argument would be absolutely the opposite. The expectation would be digital communications would eliminate echelons of command. On the contrary, it's actually increased the requirement for command presence as it's dispersed the force elements into ever ever further distances. So this sort of paradoxical proliferation of command mm -hmm. and command presence rather than a contraction of it. Mm -hmm. Well, with that, I would like to thank you very much for this interview.